Okay, so uh, here's a review about uh, what has what has been covered already and what's uh, going to be covered now. So yesterday I, I talked about linear models and structure prediction. This morning I, to I talked about neural language models and tigers. And now I'm going to talk about sequence-to-sequence -sequence models, and in particular I will cover machine translation. So sequence-to-sequence -sequence models uh, are useful to map from a source sequence, which can have arbitrary length, into a target sequence also of arbitrary length. So this is different from sequence stacking, where we assume that the input and outputs all have the same uh, number of words. Here we want to map strings uh, to, not to other strings, and you don't have any restriction about the length of those strings. Um, and so machine translation is kind of one of the examples where this arises. Uh, so here in this example, I, so the goal is to translate from a source sentence X in one language. In this case, the language is Thai. I hope this is correct, Thai. <laughs> um, is it? <laughs> it, is, it is. Okay, good. Uh, so we are translating these into English, uh, which gives this sentence Y in English. So our goal is to uh, learn a system that is able to do translations from Thai to English when we present them new sentences. All right, so let's start with an overview of the field of uh, statistical machine translation before uh, talking about neural machine translation. So machine translation research began in the early 1950s. So it kind of coincided uh, with the Cold War, and the initial research was focused a lot on Russian to English, uh, you know, mostly because of, of the Cold War. And so systems at the time, they were mostly rule-based, uh, and uh, translation was solved by using a bilingual dictionary. But there was a lot of optimism at the time. Let me see if I can show you this video. They hadn't reckoned with ambiguity when they set out to use computers to translate languages. A $500,000 supercalculator, most versatile electronic brain known, translates Russian into English. Instead of mathematical wizardry, a sentence in Russian is to be fed in... One of the first non-numerical applications of computers, it was hyped as the solution to the Cold War obsession of keeping tabs on what the Russians were doing. Claims were made that the computer would replace most human translators. At present, of course, you're just in the experimental stage. When you go in for full-scale production, what will the capacity be? We should be able to do about, with a modern commercial computer, uh, about one to two million words an hour. And this will be quite an adequate speed to cope with the whole output of the Soviet Union in just a few hours computer time a week. When do you hope to be able to achieve the speed? If our experiments go well, then perhaps within uh, five years or so. Okay, so I don't know if you if you got it, but he said that in five years we will solve machine translation. Uh, we didn't. <laughs> um, all right. So. Um, oh, okay. Okay, so one model that was quite popular uh, was the noisy channel model. It's a very inspirational model, not only for machine translation, but uh, you know, grounded in information theory, uh, developed by Claude Shannon, and uh, you know, Warren Weaver was the one who used it in machine translation. And there was this famous quote by Warren Weaver where he says, when I look at an article in Russian, I say, this is really written in English, but it has been coded in some strange symbols. I will now proceed to decode. And so this, of course, is not true, right? So, but this analogy is kind of what, uh, uh, it explains how the noisy channel model works. So let me give you a concrete example. Uh, I guess some of you might be familiar with this person. Uh, Yuan is a famous uh, researcher in, in language technologies in Thai. Um, so let's suppose that he has, he's having a conversation with Shannon and he speaks, uh, he says a sentence in Thai uh, and our goal is uh, Shannon has a mobile phone and he wants to translate this sentence to English. Okay, this is pretty much what we are assuming here. And so the way the noisy shadow model works is it pretends that Ewan is actually uh, speaking English, but then the sentence that he says gets corrupted in a noisy channel. And so something noisy comes out and this noisy thing is Thai. Okay, and then there's going to be a decoder. So this corresponds to the MT system 
whose job is to recover the original English from this noisy uh, version of the message. Um, so this is a very conceptual uh, model. It has nothing to do with the reality. Um, but so it's kind of words backwards, right? So to translate from Thai to English, uh, we are trying to recover a source that we assume it's English. Um, and so we need to combine two models here. We need to combine a channel model that models the probability uh, of uh, uh, Thai given English. And we need to cover, uh, you need to, to model the source, the source model, which is just modeling the probability of English. Okay? And so if you have monolingual data for this part, and if you have parallel data for this part, we can combine these two probabilistic models and build a machine translation system. So this is to be kind of the dominating paradigm in MT for several decades, pretty much until uh, the beginning of neural machine translation. So this is how the model works, right? So we want to retrieve uh, the English sentence Y, Y hat, that maximizes the probability of Y given X and by using Bayes' rule, you can write it as the probability of x given y times the probability of y. Of course, we need to divide by probability of x, but this is a constant, so it doesn't influence the argmax. Uh, and now this red thing is the translation model. Uh, so this is mos modeling the noisy channel. Um, it's, it models how word phrases are translated. We can use something similar to a bilingual dictionary uh, to, to account for this part. Um, and, and, and the blue part is the language model that models how we can generate fluent English, and this is something that we can learn from monolingual data only. So this is decomposed is really nice thing. Uh, okay, so let's look at these two models. How can we learn the language model? So for the language model, we need large amounts of monolingual data, uh, which are easy to get for many languages. Um, so, and, you know, uh, given that data, how can we learn a language model uh, from that data? So this is exactly what we covered in the previous lecture. Uh, so we can do it with a, Markov, with a Markov model, we can do it with a neural language model, just pick your favorites. Uh, so, you know, there's plenty of choice about the, uh, the source model. What about the translation model? So for that, it's a little bit more trickier. So we need large amounts of parallel data, uh, or at least we need enough parallel data to learn a model that has some decent quality. And by parallel data, I mean uh, pairs of human translated Russian slash English sentences. Uh, so this is kind of similar to uh, uh, what we found in finding the Rosetta Stone. I don't know if you are familiar with this. This is kind of a, a very important discovery uh, in the 19th century, in the, in the end of the 18th century uh, in Egypt. So they, they found this stone, uh, you know, with several, several millennia old, that contained parallel corpora in three languages. Uh, hieroglyphic, hieroglyphic Egyptian, ancient Egyptian, so demotic Egyptian, a more modern version of Egyptian, uh, and ancient Greek. And because um, uh, scientists knew, so the, the historians knew uh, uh, modern English, they could decipher uh, the, the other versions of Egypt based on the, the Greek part. Uh, so this, this was very useful because they, they managed to interpret, uh, you know, several uh, um, scripts uh, existed in many temples because of this. So in modern days, we don't have Rosetta Stones. We have something equivalent to, you know, tens of thousands of Rosetta Stones in the web. I'm just putting here an example of a corpus that is particularly useful if you want to translate between European languages. Uh, you know, these are proceedings uh, from the European Parliament. Uh, there are other corpora of the same kind, like the Ansart corpus between French and English uh, that corresponds to the Canadian Parliament. There is also a corpora from the United Nations. Uh, you know, we also have Wikipedia, which is more or less, you know, that we can kind of extract some parallel data from Wikipedia. There's corpus like Paracrawl, open subtitles, and so on. And this is the resources that people typically use to develop machine translation systems. Okay, so let's look at the models that uh, people came up with uh, in the 90s. Uh, so IBM was uh, a pioneer uh, in, this, in, in statistical machine translation. Um, so they, they relied on this source uh, uh, noisy uh, channel model. Uh, 
and they came up with some interesting techniques to model reordering of words from the source to the target. Uh, and so there are several models, IBM Model 1, Model 2, Model 3. I'm not going into details about that. But each of these models refines the previous iteration of the model in some, in some ways. So what, what they do is the following. To, to learn the, tr the translation model probability of x given y, uh, they uh, assume that they have enough parallel data. Uh, and they, what they do is they consider the joint probability of the sentence x and the alignments given y. So they introduce this extra variable here that corresponds to word alignments. This is because uh, words don't come in the same order for the different languages. And there might be some words in one language that do not correspond to any word on the other language. Uh, so now we have this additional variable a, which is not observed, it's latent. We need to marginalize it out. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's basically it. So here are some concrete examples. This example is for English to French. So here, for example, this word in French, le, doesn't map to any word in English. Um, so we can draw this thing as by filling this, uh, these cells in this matrix, where we have on one side English, in the other side French, and we are marking which words are aligned to which words. Um, Sometimes you have alignments that are one too many. For example, the words implemented in English is uh, mapped to mise en uh, application in French. So this is a one too many alignment. Uh, we also have many to one, like this. Um, and in general, you can even have many to many. So we can have like an entire phrase in English that maps to an entire phrase in French. And this is basically what underlies phrase-based machine translation systems, which used to be the state of the art before neural machine translation. OK, so uh, so we still need to explain how to, to learn the translation model P of x given y using this idea uh, of word alignments. Um, so we are breaking this further into the joint probability of the, the sentence and the alignments given y. And now we are going to learn this distribution by combining uh, several factors. So we are going to combine the probability of particular words aligning on the two languages by looking at co-occurrence statistics, the relative position of the words, like it's if, if the words are all consecutive, it's more likely for many languages that they also appeared consecutively uh, in, the, in the target language. Uh, and also the probability of words having a particular fertility. Fertility means uh, the number of words that they align to in the target language. And so then, uh, when as we estimate uh, these probabilities uh, at training time, if, if at test time we want to search for the best translation, we need to solve this problem, where we need to marginalize out the alignments. So we need to look for the Y that maximizes uh, these, these terms. So this, this contains the source model, and the channel model, the translation model, but we are marginalizing out the alignments. Um, and so, of course, enumerating all possible hypotheses and alignments is intractable. So this is an example of a structured prediction problem, like the ones that I presented in the first day. Uh, and so a typical approach is to do some sort of heuristic search that is going to gradually build the translation, uh, left to right, discarding hypotheses that, are, that have too low probability. And this is what uh, underlies many systems like phrase-based systems using toolkits like Moses. And you know, people who have worked already in MT might be aware of what these toolkits are. So here's a, a quick example. Uh, if we have, so now this is German to English. Uh, if we want to produce an English translation for this sentence, you might look at, uh, okay, what are the possible phrases in English that correspond to a phrase in German? This is, use, this is done using a phrase table. Each of these phrase correspondences is going to have some score that comes from a co-occurrence probability, for example. And now we need to, as, uh, to kind of put together these phrases in a co coherent way in order to maximize a global score uh, of the translation. And this is going to take account both scores that come from the alignments, scores that comes from correspondence between phrases, and also scores that come from the source model where we want to make sure that the English sentence is going to be fluent. 
Okay, so I'm, I'm just giving the main idea. Um, I'm avoiding you know, getting too, many in, uh, too much into details. Uh, so what I, what I show was just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, statistical MT uh, is or was, because now there's less and less people working on it, uh, a huge research field. Uh, the best systems for statistical MT are extremely complex. Uh, you know, I the in for example, the MOSIS system that I was mentioning, it's a very big pipeline that has many separately designed subcomponents, uh, including the translation, the language model, but there's more components. Uh, there's lots of feature engineering. Uh, system design is very language dependent, so if you have a good system for Thai to English, but you want to design a new one for Chinese to English, you need to almost do everything from scratch. Um, so you cannot reuse uh, systems that are developed for different languages. And it also requires compiling and maintaining extra resources, like phrase tables. Uh, you know, on top of that, models are usually quite big. In both in, you know, they take a lot of space in disk. They're also very memory hungry. And there's lots of human effort to maintain those models. So this was a bit of a nightmare. So those of you who worked in phrase-based MT in the past might still remember this. And you might be happy when neural machine translation started. So neural machine translation uh, started in 2014. Uh, so, you know, modern work. I mean, th there, there's been older models that uh, gave, did some attempts for using neural networks for machine translation, but they were not practical. So 2014 was the year where the first practical system uh, was developed, and it revolutionized the fields completely. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about neural machine translation. Uh, so this is basically a way of doing machine translation with a single neural network by training a system end-to-end. -end. So instead of, instead of having this huge pipeline combining all these components, uh, now instead we are going to have a system that is trained end-to-end -end just on parallel sentences. Um, so the, ar the underlying architecture is something called an encoder-decoder, uh, also called the sequence-to-sequence -sequence model. I'm going to explain what that is in a while. Uh, and so I, uh, that there's, it's common for people to refer to neural MT and statistical MT. I did it myself in this talk. But to be honest, I don't like that distinction very much because neural MT is also statistical MT, right? We are still developing a system from data using machine learning techniques. It's just that we are using neural networks instead of uh, simpler systems based on counting and normalizing and estimating probabilities directly. Um, so yeah, so maybe we should not talk about neural MT versus statistical MT, but considering neural MT as a special case of statistical MT that uses neural networks. Any question before I, I keep going? How many of you have worked already in machine translation, just to get an idea? No? No one? Okay, very few. Good. Was, was this description helpful in understanding the problem? Good. All right, so, um, so let's present the encoder-decoder architecture before uh, I'm going to make a very quick recap on recurrent neural networks, which, which was the topic for this morning. Uh, and we saw that RNNs can have many different usages. One of those usages was uh, uh, co co uh, obtaining a label for a sentence. So I call that pooled classification. So you have a sentence like this. this the task here was sentiment analysis. We have a sentence like this. I don't like it. And the goal is to produce a label for this sentence. And you do that by uh, taking a RNN, left to right, pulling the last state, and then uh, from that state have a softmax layer that is going to assign a probability for every possible label. Another usage is using RNNs, uh, autoregressive RNNs for generating sequences. So here, uh, you know, I'm generating this sentence. I like curry. I st we start with a start symbol. From this start symbol, uh, we obtain a hidden state that is a function of the previous state and the current inputs. Uh, there is a softmax and we sample from this softmax distribution. We sample the word i and then i is fed as the input to the next time step and we repeat the process until we obtain the full sentence and we terminate in a stop symbol. Once so we get the stop symbol, we are done with generating. Okay, so the simplest idea that we can think of for developing a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model is precisely to put these two things together. So let's suppose that we have one encoder, RNN, and one decoder, RNN. 
the encoder RNN is going to encode the source sentence, and it's going to generate a vector state, exactly like in the sentiment analysis case. So it's going to keep the last state after processing the full sentence, and this vector is representing all that is important about the source sentence. And then there's going to be a decoder RNN that is going to generate the target sentence exactly as an autoregressive uh, RNN, uh, but conditioned on that vector state. So instead of generating uh, you know, from, from scratch, uh, we feed, instead of using these uh, initial states, uh, a parameter of the model, we are going to start to, uh, we are going to condition the target sentence on the vector that we obtain from the encoder. And by doing that, we expect the decoder to be informed about the relevant information that exists in the source sentence. Does this make sense? Any question? Okay, so this looks like a crazy idea, right? Uh, I mean, when I first saw, I, I could not believe that this could possibly work. Um, so this is what the model, uh, so this is what the encoder looks like. So exactly like the slide I had before. So we have a sentence with four words, and we are just saving everything as a vector. The entire sentence is now encoded as a vector. Um, so we can you know, denote that by C, this vector, being a RNN function of the sentence X. Um, all right, and then to compute the probability of a target sentence Y, we are going to define a conditional probability distribution, Y given X, sampling from another model that takes C as the input. So it takes C as the, uh, the only information that you retain about the source sentence. So this is what the entire thing looks like. In this case, the example is a translation from German to English. Uh, so we uh, have an encoder RNN over the German sentence. We obtain this vector that comes after the stop symbol. And then this vector is used as input to initialize uh, the first word that is going to get decoded in English. And then we proceed, as usual, as a non-autoregressive, non uh, sorry, as an autoregressive RNN. So beginnings is going to be the input for the next time step, and so on and so forth, until we hit the stop symbol. Another way of depicting the same thing, and sometimes you might see this in papers, is, is using this picture. So this is basically saying that the source sentence is ABC, then there is a stop symbol, and then from this start symbol, we start generating the, the translation. So the first uh, word that you generate is W, then X, then Y, then Z, then stop. And, uh, you know, and since this is not a regressive model, then W gets uh, fed in the next time step. And the same thing for X and so on. So this model is extremely simple. Uh, so this was invented at Google in 2014, inspired by some concurrent work done by other people. Um, and so it didn't, it didn't uh, outperform existing statistical machine translation systems at the time, but it got very close. Uh, of course, they need to do a lot of engineering to make it work, including having to use very deep LSTMs. Well, they didn't use RNNs, of course, so every time I say RNN here, what I mean is LSTM. Uh, and, uh, and some other problems that they had to solve. So for example, one problem that they noted with this model is that uh, and this is quite expected, if the source sentence is long, the encoder may forget the initial words and the translation will be degraded. So this is related to the difficulty that uh, recurrent neural networks, even LSTMs, have to uh, retain uh, information about things that are far away in history. Um, so, uh, and the solution for that, a poor man's solution, but it was good enough to solve the problem, is to reverse the source sentence. And the intuition for that is if the source and target language don't have you know, very different orderings, it's, like, it's likely that the beginning of the source sentence is closer to the beginning of the target language, uh, the target sentence. And this makes it easier to start translating, to start generating the target symbols. And after we get started, then it's, it's easier to continue and to produce the rest of the translation. But still, there's uh, some degradation that uh, uh, happens uh, if we start translating longer and longer sentences. So this works reasonably well for short sentences. When sentences are long, then it starts, uh, it, it doesn't work as well. Um, and so in this model, the decoder does grid search, greedy search, uh, 
and this leads to error propagation. This is a general problem um, with uh, when we use RNNs, uh, autoregressive RNNs. Uh, so if you do a mistake early on during the translation, then uh, these words are going to be uh, to, to feed the next time steps, and uh, the translation may degrade uh, substantially. And so the solution for that is to try to be a little less greedy by using beam search. So let, let me talk a little bit about beam. Are you familiar with beam search? Who knows what beam search is? OK, not that many. Uh, OK, so let me give some intuition about what beam search is doing. So ideally, we want to find the target sentence y that maximizes this probability, conditional probability of y given x. Uh, and you know, as I was saying this morning, we do that by taking the products of uh, uh, the probability of yi for every time step i, conditioned on everything that was generated before. And now, because this model is conditioned on x, also conditioned on the source sentence x. Um, and of course, we cannot obtain the argmax, the, the y that maximizes this probability, because this will require enumerating all possible uh, target sentences, and this is intractable. So uh, you know, the greedy approach, what it does is to uh, pick the argmax one step at a time. Uh, so beam search does something a little bit better. It does an approximate search strategy to look for the best y, the y that maximizes that probability. And what it does is the following. Instead of just computing the best y in each time step, it keeps track of the k most probable partial translations. So this is called the beam size. It keeps a window of the k uh, most probable partial translations at each step, and it discards the rest. Um, so when k is 1, this is exactly the same as greedy search. It means that you only keep the best hypothesis at each time step. But if with k greater than 1, uh, we, we might, uh, so if you do a mistake early on, we might regret uh, following that path, and you might uh, uh, obtain higher probability by using another hypothesis in the beam. But there is a limit of the size of the beam that we can use to make this tractable. So typically, people use beams between 5 and 10. Um, so here's a, a, an illustration for a beam size of 2 uh, for generating an English sentence. Uh, so this is the start symbol. D and A are the two most probable words to be generated in the first step. Uh, then uh, for each of these two uh, uh, hypotheses, we expand them again with the size of two, and we get these two possible continuations. And now we take these four possibilities and we can only retain two. Uh, so, so we are retaining poor in both cases. So we have now two hypotheses, the poor and A poor. Uh, and now we keep uh, expanding this, and every time we select the top two hypotheses out of these four possibilities, and as we keep doing, we obtain the final translation, which in this case is going to be this thing highlighted in green. Um, so maybe if we were greedy, if we were starting by just picking the word with the highest probability, uh, we could follow a different path. We could f so assuming that this is sorted by probability, we will get uh, this. This uh, you'll get here, and then you know we will get probably the wrong translation. So, so having a larger beam might be better, and in general you get better scores by doing this. Okay, so um, as I, I was showing in the beginning, uh, previous uh, statistical machine translation models were very complicated pipelines, um, and so as an alternative. We can do this end-to-end -end neural MT using a simple encoder-decoder architecture. This is nice, but it doesn't quite work yet. Uh, uh, so, but it gets close to, to top performance. Let me. Sh uh, right, I thought I had some numbers here, but I don't. Um, right. So this, this just to give you a chronology. Uh, so neural MT went from uh, a fringe research activity in 2014 to become the leading standard method in 2016. So in only two years, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, outperformed years of research in machine translation done by bigger, big communities. Uh, so the first sequence-to-sequence -sequence paper was published in 2014, and by 2016, two years later, 
Google Translate switched from SMT to NMT. And uh, every, every other big company did the same. Um, and this is quite amazing. Uh, so SMT systems have been developed by hundreds of engineers over many years. When I, w when I was doing my PhD, I was not working in SMT. But uh, it's, it was like a very hard field to enter because most of the theses were basically working in a small detail in a big s pipeline. Uh, and you know, suddenly people who follow that path became uh, a bit uh, outdated when uh, all, all the research went into neural machine translation. Um, so this was quite impressive. Okay, so of course machine translation is not solved. This was a rhetorical question. Uh, there's many difficulties that remain. Uh, one of them is out of vocabulary words. Uh, so, you know, quite often uh, at, at test time, we find a word that, we, that didn't exist at training time. And we, what should we do in that case? Um, so this is particularly uh, relevant if you are translating into language with the rich morphology. Uh, so maybe you, you saw a form of that word, but it was a different form. Uh, and unless we have a character level model or something uh, that uses subwords, it's going to be hard to generate the correct inflection for that word. Another problem is domain mismatch between train and test data. You don't see that so much in, in, in research papers, but in practice, in industry, this is something that happens all the time. Uh, so the typical data that exists to train machine translation systems Things like uh, uh, newswire or uh, proceedings, parliament proceedings, or data crawled from the web. It's commonly very v in a very different domain than the domains where we apply these machine translation systems. So this is a problem that I see every day at NBEML. And so this means that you need some strategy for a domain adaptation, for taking advantage of uh, large data in a generic domain, maybe small parallel data in the domain of interests, and adapt the system to work well in that domain. This is a very important area of research. Uh, so another problem are low resource language pairs. If, if we are working on, if you're doing translation for language pairs that don't have uh, very large parallel data, uh, it's, it's a bit hopeless to get good neural MT, MT systems to work. So neural machine translation systems are particularly uh, dependent on the availability of, of parallel data. Uh, more than statistical MT systems were. Uh, so there are some examples where SMT systems are still better than NMT if we don't have enough parallel data. So we need at least like uh, hundreds of thousands uh, or, or a million of parallel data to get some decent performance. Um, okay, and finally, maintaining contexts over longer texts, uh, which is something that I'm going to cover next. So if you think about the model that I just presented, uh, you know, uh, uh, this, uh, the same way I was puzzled about how could it possibly work, you might have been thinking the same thing. You know, how is it possible to store uh, all the information about the sentence in a single vector? Uh, you know, in practice, sentence, sentences have unbound in length. They can be as far as large as we want. Uh, and vectors have a finite capacity. They have a finite dimensionality. Uh, so a possible practical problem that arises in practice is uh, um, how can LSTMs learn uh, to cope with the distance between translations and, and, and their sources when these words are distant from each other? And this leads us to a model called encoder-decoder with attention. Before I proceed, any question? Do you, did you already know the stuff that I'm describing or not? <laughs> All right. Um. No. I thought there was a question in the back. Okay, so, um, uh, so the main trick uh, for the encoder-decoder model with attention is to encode sentences as matrices instead of Hello. vectors. Hello. Hi. Ah. Uh, I have a question, um, because uh, we were talking here about the low resource languages which don't have uh, uh, parallel corpora. So uh, then this only means that these machine translation have not been applied on this language before. So how to evaluate rather 
uh, such kind of situation when we have chosen a language which uh, which is deficit in corpora or maybe zero resource like language so how would we i mean compare yeah that, that's a great question so the the usually uh, for evaluating it you know we, you only need to translate uh, a much smaller number of sentences so it's still possible to evaluate the performance of MT systems for low resource languages because it doesn't require a lot of annotation. The problem is having enough training data to develop good quality MT systems. Uh, and this is a current uh, topic of research. There are different strategies that people have been trying. Like for example, looking at languages that, are, that have more resources and are somehow related to the low resource language that you want to learn a model for. Uh, um, you know, combining monolingual data with uh, parallel data. So there are techniques like back translation, the back translating, which I'm not going to describe here, that uh, start by developing uh, a kind of initial version of the model on the reverse direction, uh, then uh, apply that model to a lot of monolingual data for that language. And, you know, even low resource languages sometimes you can find uh, enough amounts of monolingual data to make this work. And this creates like fake source data. And you can then combine the small amount of parallel data that you have with this artificial back translated data and, and train a system on the combination of these two data sets. And this kind of mitigates the problem. It doesn't completely solve it. I think it's pretty much still an open problem. But uh, there's a lot of work done in this area. There's also work that does things like zero shot machine translation. Where they, where they try to uh, learn models that mix all the languages at the same time, where you just give a arbitrary uh, text in a source language, uh, and, you want to, and you pass a flag that, gives you, that tells you the language that you want to generate a translation for, and then the system is trained to, to cope with whatever language uh, we use. Any more questions? Yes. Um, one more technique, like the, if we are talking about the low resource, um, for example, if the Thai language, uh, we want to translate better, um, from Thai to English, and uh, if we don't have the much data, like the thought to target, and we may um, using the Thai sentence into the Google Translate and, and to get the output from the um, English from the two Google translation. What do you, um, can, do you recommend that to use this um, path and sentence to train the model? That, that makes sense to you. So uh, if I understand correctly, your suggestion, you're saying using Google Translate to produce reference translations, right? We want to expand the data set, right? right. So, uh, I mean, it's possible to do it, but there's always a limit. It's very unlikely that we can outperform Google Translate by doing that because you are training your system on the output of Google Translate. Uh, but you can do things like this back translation trick. So if you get uh, like a reference sentences in Thai, let's suppose that you want to train a system from English to Thai. You, you can, if you can get some monolingual data in Thai, then you can use Google Translate to translate from Thai to English. And then you create these, uh, you know, artificial pairs, but where the reference is correct, and the reference is more important than the target is more important than the source, because you are training a system to generate the target. Uh, and by combining these two things, it's it's a little bit similar as the noisy channel model in the sense that you combine uh, uh, lots of monolingual data that in the in the noisy channel model was used to create a source model. Uh, with a translation model that uh, relies on parallel data. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's also techniques that are used to uh, take a bigger model and do distillation into a small model where it could fit what you are saying about Google Translate. So if you assume that uh, Google Translate is a big model uh, and we don't even know which data it was trained on, you can use it to produce uh, translations and then trying to have a smaller model that tries to at least uh, kind of get close to what Google is doing. I, I, I suspect that you cannot, uh, this is not probably going to be useful to outperform Google Translate, but maybe it gets you closer to what Google Translate does. Okay, so yeah, so we saw this simple strategy of representing, representing a, a sentence as a vector and then using that vector to decode a target sentence. 
So now I'm going to talk about a uh, different strategy that represents sentences not as vectors but as matrices. Um, and so the main intuition here is that sentences have different sizes, vectors have the same size. Maybe what you should do is have a vector per word in the source and not a vector for the entire sentence. Um, and so this can be done by using this uh, uh, idea of using an attention mechanism that, that has been extremely influential, not just in machine translation, but in neural networks. Um, so in my opinion, this was one of the big uh, <laughs> discoveries in the, in the last few years in, in, in neural networks. Um, okay, so, so the idea of these matrices is they're going to have a fixed number of rows. This corresponds to the hidden dimension. Uh, but they're going to have a number of columns that depends on the number of words. So we have one vector, so one vector per word, and these vectors are the columns of this matrix. Uh, and then before generating each word in the decoder, there is going to be an attention mechanism that is basically doing something similar to the alignment that I had in the beginning. So it's kind of trying to align the word that you want to generate with the, the information that is the most relevant in the source. So the, the basic intuition for attention mechanisms comes from alignment in, in statistical machine translation. So here's, here's the first shot into developing a model that uses that encodes a sentence as a matrix. We could uh, have a vector for every word in the source, and then uh, just uh, you know uh, this could be, for example, word embeddings, and then we could just define uh, a matrix that contains these vectors as columns. Uh, the problem with this is that if you take this as word embeddings, there is nothing that looks at the contextual information of each word. So these are just independent words, right? So we need something that uh, uh, carries some information, uh, some contextual information. So other strategies include using convolutional neural networks. And in fact, before the most recent uh, neural MT models, there's wor there's, there was work developing uh, I think this is actually the first neural machine translation model, uh, the first paper published on the topic developed at DeepMinds, where they uh, have a convolutional uh, neural network as the encoder. Um, and so uh, by doing that, they can capture some contextual information in the encoder. Um, and uh, so the common choice, though, is using bidirectional LSTMs. Well, the common choice until two years ago, before transformers was using a bidirectional LSTM uh, as the encoder. This was a famous paper by uh, Badanao and others in 2015. Uh, so later in 2017, the Transformers Networks offers another solution to this problem. So let, let us start with the bidirectional LSTM encoder. Uh, so again, we have this sentence in German that we want to translate into English. We start by uh, having uh, word embeddings for each of the words. And now we just use a LSTM encoder, pretty much as I was described in the, mor in describing in the morning, a, bi a bidirectional LSTM, one the left to right and another one right to left. We concatenate uh, the, these two vectors, and then we end up with this matrix. Okay, so each column of this, of this matrix corresponds to a German word. Uh, so now we have this matrix that I'm calling F that represents the input, now, how can we generate our translation from this matrix? And this is where attention comes into play. Um, so here's how it works. Uh, so we are going to generate the output sequence uh, word by word using an, an RNN as before. And at each output position, at the position T, the RNN is going to look at two inputs. It's going to look uh, at a fixed size vector embedding of the previous output symbol yt minus one. So this is by the time where it needs to output generate yt. Uh, and it's also going to look at a fixed size vector uh, that encodes a snapshot, a view of the input matrix uh, by a weighted sum of its columns. And this can be written as a product between the, vec the matrix F that I had before with an attention vector at that uh, describes uh, how much attention is being placed how much attention is being placed on each of these four source words. So I, I have like a diagram that explains this in a bit more detail. And so, uh, so if you multiply the matrix F by this vector AT, we get a vector 
And this vector is representing the source. But we get a different vector for every word that you are generating, because our AT can be different for every time step. And this uh, vector AT is called the attention distribution. So let me be a little bit more concrete. Uh, let's suppose that the states that the decoder RNN is producing are, are denoted by S1, S2, and so on. When we are predicting the target word at position T, we start by computing a similarity with each of the source words. So these H's are the states in the encoder. So HI is the state corresponding to a uh, word at position I in the source. So this is the column I of the matrix F. Uh, so we are going to uh, compute uh, a function of, these, of each of these vectors, HI, uh, of the previous states, ST minus one, um, and I'm going to take a dot product with a vector V, which is a parameter of the network, and this is going to return a scalar, and we are going to interpret the scalar as a sort of a similarity between the word that we want to generate at position T and the source word at position I. Okay, so the, the, uh, the intuition is, if you want the, the, the word that you are generating to be aligned with the source words, then this number needs to be very high. If, it's, if the source word I is irrelevant for the next word that you are generating, then this score needs to be low. Okay, so now you have, so we are, we are going to compute a vector Z, ZT, that contains these quantities for every source word I. So this is going to be a vector whose dimensionality is going to be the length of the source. Uh, so this is vector ZT here, right? Uh, this contains a score for every source word. And the next thing that we do is to make a softmax transformation of ZT, and this is going to output a probability distribution over the source words. Okay, so this AT is a probability vector, uh, which means that it sums to one, it's non-negative, and the dimensionality of this vector is the number of source words. Um, then we are going to use this vector AT to compute uh, a input conditioning state CT by multiplying our, our matrix F that represented the, the, the source by this vector AT, and this is going, going to return a vector CT that is going to uh, represent a kind of a snapshot of the source that is relevant for the next word that you are generating. And finally, we are going to update the RNN state ST based on the previous state ST minus one, the previous word that has been generated, and this state CT. And after uh, updating these RNN states, we can finally predict the next word to be generated. Okay, so maybe this looked a lot of math. Let, let's look at practice uh, for this diagram. So, you know, this is kind of, uh, this is the English sentence that we have uh, as a source. Sorry, this is the German sentence that we have as a source. And this is the English sentence that you want to generate. At each step, uh, we are going to compute an attention vector that is going to provide some probability value to each of the source words. So for example, by the time we generate the second sentence, we are going to uh, produce an attention vector A2 that has more mass on the word Möchte in German, less probability mass on these other words. Uh, and as a consequence of that, we are going to generate the word like in English, which is kind of aligned to this German word, Möchte. Um, okay, so, uh, and th but then in the next time step, we are going to attend to a different part of the source. Any question about this? Do you understand the explanation? So feel free to ask questions. <laughs> this, this I have a question. Yeah. Actually, I'm working on this translation aspect, that's why. Um, I mean, 
I just, uh, I'm just trying to grab it. Uh, in the previous slides, you were mentioning that because I was going through a fluency evaluation metric, so target sentence is independent um, indep during the evaluation time when we are seeing if this is going to be fluent or not, target sentence which is produced. Mm -hmm. So then we don't take into consideration the source sentence, right? This is the fluency standard, uh, standard by CDA to evaluate if the translation produced is okay or not. So uh, I'm just amazing to ask because I couldn't understand this technical stuff. You were saying when the current word is going to be uh, producing the target sentence alignment going on, then it has to take into consideration the previous word of uh, the source and the previous word of the target as well. I couldn't understand this okay. one. Okay, so so uh, so you were, the first thing that you mentioned was related to how to evaluate the quality of translation, and you are talking about fluency. Yeah, yeah. Where we don't look at the source, but uh, this model is capturing not just fluency; it's also capturing adequacy where it, the goal is to see if this is actually a good translation for that source sentence. Right. And so there it's important to attend to the source. And so what, what the model is doing is, it's attending to the previous, so when it generates YT, mm. it, at, it attends to uh, the previous word that was generated, YT minus one, which is, which is kind of ensuring the fluency that you want. Mm. But it's also looking at the representation of the source, CT, that is produced by attending to the relevant part of the source that is relevant for the word that I want to generate at this time step in the target. Right. So this is kind of the alignment, okay? So the attention is providing alignment information, but it's like soft alignment, because this is a, a probability vector. It's not, attending, it's not aligning only to a single source words, it's spreading probability mass over the several source words. Thank you. Any further questions? There's there's one behind you and one. Okay, um, I just want to confirm if my understanding is correct. So basically, the attention is so you apply the softmax function on the similarity score between the words in the source and the current like word in the target sentence and then you multiply the attention with <laughs> wait what what is the f again <laughs> uh, so the, the f is is the matrix that represents the source so f oh. is this matrix so each row each column in f is a vector that represents each word in the source okay when we multiply f by the vector 80 we are basically doing a weighted combination of columns Okay. Right? So su suppose, for example, that detention is a one-hot distribution that gives uh, one probability to the second words and zero probability to the others. Then F multiplied by AT, we just select this column. So it will just select as context the vector corresponding to the second words. Okay. Right? In general, attention is soft. Right? So it's going to be like a mixture of the different columns. And then you obtain CT from that, and then you update the in based on like the previous prediction and the previous date. Is that yes? It so that, that's it. So we start by computing a similarity between the target word that you are generating and each of the uh, possible source words. Okay. This can be a positive or negative number. Then we do a softmax transformation that uh, gives a probability distribution over the source words. Then we do this weighted combination of columns for that matrix. And this CT is now representing uh, 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 input conditioning states that tells us uh, what's relevant in the source for the next word that I want to generate. Okay, thank you. So, so compared to the, the previous model that was just representing the full sentence as a vector, the previous model, we're just using a static C here. And this C was the last state of the RNN. So the model with attention is computing a dynamic CT that depends on where the model looks at when it outputs the next symbol. That's the main intuition.
So I'm, I'm trying to understand the, uh, the concept here. So is it, uh, is, is it correct to think of it as a way of incorporating the context information as well? Like using attention to incorporate the context around, yeah, the source context, is it? Yeah, that, that's basically it. So, uh, so the attention is a way of incorporating the relevant source context when you are predicting a word in a target. Okay. One more. And go back to the slide 49 and go to the next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, yeah. Um, I am wondering that about the number of attentions and in general, that um, how, how many attentions that you need to have like the, for the one sentence and then to do recommend. Okay, so so we so you have five attention vectors because you are outputting five words, including the stop symbol. So each of these a one, a two, a three corresponds to one timestamp, and uh, and the, they are all four dimensional because we are attending at uh, four words in the source. So this is why this attention matrix or the attention history, if you want, is five by four. So it's kind of, uh, at each, each word that it generates, we add another row in these, in these metrics. <laughs> um, one of my questions is, um, if we have like the range of the sequence, input sequence, like the L, and I don't know uh, how, for, for example, we want to translate from the input sequence to the t target sequence, and we don't know how, how long, like how, how much length is of the output. Yeah, and we, that we means we have to define the, all of the A attention, right? Like the so so this, this history is, co is computing dynamically, right? So when you start to decode, we don't know at, at, at test time, we don't know what's going to be the size of the sentence that you are decoding. So we keep adding rows until we meet the stop symbol. So when you reach the stop symbol, this is the time where we, uh, we need to stop. And that's it. Exactly as in the previous model. Thank you. So the question is, can we also add attention at the, the target instead of source? So the question was if we can add attention over the targets. This is getting closer to what the transformers models do. Uh, so they add attention over the source and attention over the target, like self-attention. Uh, I'm going to get there. Sir, I have another question. I mean, mm, I don't see the mention of Bikram or mm, because maybe SMT, we are not in consideration or because it's just we are considering uh, Unigram, uh, one wo word by word, and when attention is the context, so we are just uh, making uh, just one word in attention, not the bigram or maybe trigram. Previous maybe two, three words are determining the semantics. Are uh. true. So, so each attention is going is only going to attend to a single word, but but keep in mind that the these states come from an LSTM, so these states have contextual information. So the vectors that represent each of these words, they came from propagating uh, LSTM states from left to right and right to left, which means that these vectors encode some information about the neighborhood of these words. All right. Okay, so let's, let's move on. Uh, so I think I only have 10 minutes left, so I need to rush a little bit. <laughs> Um, all right, so putting all together, this is how the algorithm looks like. Um, so this is basically recapping what I just said. So we start by generating the start symbol. We learn the initial, so the initial state is a model parameter. We call it S0. At each time step, we are computing these similarities by, uh, you know, this is now in matrix notation. So we are looking at the entire matrix that represents all the source words and you're computing a similarity vector for the word at position T that you want to generate. We compute the attention distribution AT. Uh, we compute the input conditioning state CT 
by taking these products. And then we update the RNN state by conditioning on the previous state, uh, the embedding uh, of the previous symbol, and this state CT. Uh, and you sample the next words from a softmax distribution. And these are model parameters again. And we do this until we emit a stop symbol. Okay, so we have 30 minutes, so I can uh, <laughs> relax again. <laughs> okay, so um, so attention is closely related to pooling operations in ConvNets. I don't know if you co you covered ConvNets, right, in the computer vision classes? Okay, good. Um, so attention in MT plays a similar role as alignment, and, and I think this was the main motivation for introducing attention in machine translation, but it's kind of a soft alignment instead of a hard alignment. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you look at this model proposed by Badanao et al., the one that I just presented, it has no bias favoring diagonal attention, uh, favoring short jumps, which are common if the languages are similar enough. So we don't want to have kind of uh, arbitrary complex reorderings for many language pairs that you are interested in. It also doesn't model fertility, uh, but there's, there's some recent work that tries to add some of these structural biases and this ends up benefiting the quality of machine translation a little bit. There's also work that tries to, that constrains the amount of attention that each word can receive by modeling fertility directly. So this is work coming from my group, uh, published last year at ACL. Um, so yeah, in general, attention was a great idea. So it significantly improved NMT performance. It addressed one of the main limitations of the initial sequence to sequence model that I presented. Um, it's very useful to allow the decoder to focus only on certain parts of the source. Uh, it solves the bottleneck problem. So the bottleneck problem was basically representing the source sentence as a single vector. Uh, it solved that by allowing the decoder to look directly at the source. Um, it also helps with the vanishing gradient problem. This is an interesting outcome. So because we are attending uh, n not only to the last state of the LSTM, but we have like a shortcut that points to a particular word in the source. Uh, learning is easier because when we backpropagate, we can backpropagate information directly to the encoder state that generated that word that is now aligning to the target word that you are producing. Uh, attention also provides some interpretability. So if you look at attention maps, uh, we can see what the decoder was focusing on when it, when it generated the particular words. Um, and so this is very cool because we never explicitly train a word aligner. So you know, uh, in, in, in older statistical MT models, the word aligner was an external model that you needed to train separately from the rest of the MT system. And here it's embedded uh, in the MT system itself. So here's an example of an attention map. This comes from the original uh, Badanao et al's paper. Uh, and this is where, so this is a translation from French to English. And this is showing where most of the probability was put at the time that each of these words was generated. Here are some plots from uh, the, the, the paper that Google published afterwards when they released uh, a neural MT version of their system uh, where they got, you know, I'm not going into details on these examples, but it had very good performance on sentences that are difficult, but there's also a lot of negative examples. In particular, a common behavior of these models is sometimes to drop source words uh, by not attending to those words. So for example, uh, in this example, this was a, a translation from German to English. Uh, so there is a part, so this is the human reference, and this is what the neural MT system is producing. Uh, there is an entire part that is omitted in the output of the machine translation system. So this part during and after the Second World War, it's not there in the, in the translation. The system just outputted the stop symbol here and it didn't bother to translate this part of the source. So this happens sometimes, ignoring source words. Uh, so it, this is tricky because if a human looks at the translation, um, then it looks very fluent. So it might think that, okay, this translation looks fluent, so it's probably the correct translation but it doesn't realize that there might be information in the source that is being dropped. Uh, another common pattern is repeated source words. Uh, so for example here, 
it's funny how this time to come back to this time of the year. So it's repeating this time. And this is something that happens sometimes. So the entire idea also can also be used for using, uh, instead of sequence to sequence, uh, condi uh, doing conditional language generation with the different inputs, for example, images. So here the example is we want to generate a caption for the image. Uh, and the attention also indicates where the system is looking at when it emits a word. So for example, here, when it emits the word Frisbee, it's actually looking at, at the Frisbee object. Which is really cool. So you know, uh, it, sometimes it works very well. There's also cases where it doesn't. So this is like an extreme example of a bad translation. <laughs> um, but so attention in general is a very useful idea. Uh, so it's it's used in other problems besides MT. Sometimes uh, under different names, but it has been applied to image caption generation, to speech recognition, memory networks, uh, where we have. Uh, uh, where you can model the, the memory, you can memorize an entire corpus and attending to that memory to answer questions. Uh, also in neural Turing machines and other differentiable computers, this work of attention is there. Okay, so the other question is, uh, so we just defined attention as a softmax over a vector of scores. Uh, but there m it might be possible to have other forms of attention. So one particular area that I find very exciting, we have some work th uh, about that in our group, is to look at sparse attention. So instead of computing a softmax transformation and get a dense uh, vector of probability scores, uh, and instead of, in the other extreme, doing hard attention, where we just aligned to a single word, uh, we have some work where we try to have a sparse probability distribution that comes from attending to a vector of similarity scores. And so we call that transformation sparse max. Uh, it's also possible to put constraints on how much attention each word can receive. This is useful to model fertility. So I'm going to go briefly through these two approaches. Uh, so sparse max, it's kind of more general than attention. It's, it's, a, it's a sparse friendly alternative to soft max. And the way it's defined is we have our vector of scores, our vector of similarities if you want, our vector z. And we define the sparse max transformation as the projection of this vector z onto the probability simplex. So here, this denotes the uh, c minus one dimensional probability simplex. So we are doing an Euclidean projection onto the probability simplex. Uh, and these projections are likely to hit the boundary of the simplex. And when they hit the boundary, this means that some coordinates of p are going to become zero. This is why we get the sparse probability distribution in the end. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm skipping the details here, but there's very nice properties that this transformation has. Uh, for example, it's end-to-end -end differentiable. You can compute the gradients efficiently. We can also evaluate it efficiently. Um, the gradient is sparse, so it's, if you do gradient back propagation, the, back, the backward pass is faster than if you do a softmax attention. Um, and, and yeah, that's basically it. So it's very practical to use. There's, implementations in PyTorch, TensorFlow, and so on. Um, just to give you an intuition about how this looks like in 2D. So in 2D, softmax is basically uh, a sigmoid, this blue line, this dashed blue line. Uh, sparse max corresponds to a hard sigmoid. So this is why it's exactly sparse. It saturates exactly uh, if the scores are too far from each other. Um, in 3D, we have something similar. So softmax is a smooth surface, uh, and sparse max is piecewise linear, but it saturates. So it has like a, a similar asymptotics as softmax, except that the saturation is exact. So if you are working on a problem where, for some reason, you want a sparse probability distribution, either in the context of a sparse attention or something else, sparse max can be a good alternative to use. Um, so the other uh, attention that it's also useful, in particular for MT, is something called constraint softmax. So this is something that resembles softmax, uh, but it allows imposing some hard constraints on the maximum probability that each word can receive. So we can say, for example, okay, this source word, I don't want that this word receives too, ma too many attention, because too, too much attention sometimes leads to repetitions in the targets. 
So if you want to avoid, you know, problems like like this, this time, this time, one way of doing that is to limit how much attention these two words can receive. Because in this case, probably the source, the corresponding in the source of these two words got too much attention and this is why these words uh, got repeated in the target. And so to do that, we can formulate uh, constraint softmax as uh, the distribution P that minimizes the KL divergence. Do you know what the KL divergence is? Okay, so if you don't know, <laughs> forget about it, but if you, if you know what it is, this is basically looking for a distribution uh, that is as close as possible to the softmax of Z, but satisfies this constraint. So these are upper bounds that we give to each coordinate of the distribution. This is where we put constraints on how much attention a word can receive. Um, so if u is a vector of ones, or, or larger than one, then these constraints are, are loose, which means that we just recover softmax. So the KL divergence is going to be zero and P becomes softmax. Uh, if U is a point in the simplex, then the constraints are tight, and then the solution is going to be P equals U. Uh, but if you are somewhere in the middle, then we can actually put some constraints. And we did that for, for machine translation to model fertility. Um, so yeah, actually what we did was constraint sparse max, which is similar to constraint softmax, except that instead of using the KL divergence, we use a squared Euclidean distance here. So this gets us both sparse probability and constrained attention. It's kind of the best of both worlds regarding sparse max and constrained softmax. Okay, so I'm not going to bother you with all these details. I'm just going to mention that this can be useful if you want to, uh, to encode the idea of fertility in neural machine translation systems. Sorry? Do you have a question? Um, what is fertility? Okay, sorry, I should have mentioned that. I think I, I briefly mentioned that in the beginning, but maybe not, uh, uh, didn't, got give, uh, didn't give enough emphasis. So it's basically the number of target words that the source word is aligned to. So in, if you want to think in the context of attention, it's basically how much uh, cumulative attention a source word receives. Uh, but the idea comes from IBM models in statistical MT. And it's basically, if you have one too many alignments, is uh, how many target words are aligned with this single source word. Okay. Uh, so, okay, so here are some examples of attention maps using softmax versus constrained sparse max. So the one in the left is using softmax. And, you know, for example, we have this repetition, the last standard appears twice. This is avoided. Uh, well, this is avoided in the constraint softmax. We don't have this repetition anymore. Maybe because we are kind of imposing uh, a threshold, uh, a maximum uh, fertility for those words. And something similar appears in the example in the right. And you have a bunch of examples. How much time do I have? 50? 15? Okay. Uh, right, okay, so there are some examples here where we compare all these different attentions, softmax, sparsemax, constraint softmax, constraint sparsemax, and so on. All right, okay, so, yes? So it seems you're introducing uh, hyperparameters into your softmax. Uh, any uh, suggestion on how to pick them, or is it like very sensitive to the results? Anything, any like suggestion on that? Hyperparameters on the softmax? What? Ah, you, so you mean the upper bound u that we want to put here? That's a great question. I forgot to mention that. So this, the, the nice thing about this transformation is that you can differentiate both with respect to the score z, but you can also differentiate with respect to the upper bounds. So you can, you can have a model, uh, a part of your neural network, can be predicting what's the uh, fertility that you want to give to a word, and your model can learn from that information. But in practice, what we did was we used an external aligner uh, to provide at training time to provide information about what's the fertility at training time for each word. And then uh, the model learned to set up their own upper bounds based on that training information. Does, does that answer your question?
Okay, so let's move on to other uh, models. Uh, so here are some adva disadvantages of the RNN architecture. So one, one big disadvantage is that this sequential computation prevents parallelization. So if you want to train these models, uh, as we usually do, so we need to uh, do all this sequential computation in RNNs, right? So each state of the RNN depends on the previous states, uh, and so on and so forth. So we need to have this linear pass for all the time steps. We cannot parallelize, uh, all, uh, you cannot parallelize the computation then on these different time steps. Uh, the second problem is that long range dependencies between words that are far apart, they involve too many computation steps. So this is related to the difficulty that uh, recurrent uh, models have to uh, retain uh, information about things that are far away in the history. Uh, you know, they can, uh, they can take advantage of that information, but in practice, this, if, 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 you, if there are two words that are separated by 20 positions, they might have trouble to retain things that are far away, even with things like GRUs or LSTMs. Uh, and so the solution for those problems is to, well, one possible solution, not the one that is most widely adopted right now, but it's kind of moving in a direction, is to replace the RNN encoder by a convolutional neural network, uh, a hierarchical CNN. Um, so this is what a model proposed by Facebook did a couple of years ago. So they proposed to, instead of having an RNN in the source and in a target, they replace it by CNNs, just like models used in vision, but convolutions in 1D. Um, and by doing that, you know, the distance between words that are far away, far away in, the, in the source, it gets smaller because you just need to uh, propagate through the hierarchy of the convolutions, and then there's going to be some state that captures information coming from these two words. So this, this was nice. It didn't improve performance you know, significantly, but uh, it speed up training a little bit. And at test time, I think it was not much faster because uh, since all these models here are autoregressive, uh, the decoding needs to be sequential at test time. So the point that I was making about parallelization, we can only, if, if you are using an autoregressive model, either using a recurrent neural network or a transformer or a CNN, we can only hope to speed up things at training time because at test time, we still need to have these autoregressive uh, steps that uh, forces us to do sequential computation. So, ah, okay, so the model that I showed from Facebook was actually a convolutional encoder. So they, they, they did a convolutional encoder and they kept an LSTM as a decoder. But later they also introduced a CNN decoder, pretty much the same story. Um, they need to, so at decoding time, uh, the, the convolutions need to be only over output prefixes because you cannot look into the future. So this means that we need to train these models with some masking in the decoder. Um, so the encoder is parallelizable, but the decoder still requires this sequential computation. So this is how the model looks like in that case, right? So this is the hierarchy of convolutions, 1D convolutions, and then the decoder is only attending, uh, so it's, it's only doing convolutions over a prefix. So by the time it generates word at position eight, it cannot attend to words that are uh, you know, uh, in the future. Okay, so let's move on to self-attention and transformer networks. Um, so this relies on the idea of self-attention. Uh, so we saw already that uh, RNNs uh, and also CNN decoders, they require an attention mechanism. This was a very big idea uh, proposed in 2015. Uh, attention is allows focusing on an arbitrary position in the source sentence, shortcutting the computation graph. Um, but if attention gives us access to any state, maybe we don't need the RNN. So this is kind of what you were suggesting in your question, right? Maybe you can also have attention uh, in the decoder as opposed to do this sequential computation. Uh, and so this is the key idea in transformers. So instead of using RNNs or CNNs, they just use self-attention in the encoder uh, and also in the decoder. But uh, let's focus on the encoder first. So this is how the model looks like. Um, so each word state 
in every position is going to attend to all the other words. Um, also in the source, okay? So this is all the encoder. Uh, each of these, so the, because this is all happening in the encoder, we call this self-attention. So the encoder is attending to itself. Um, each self-attention is followed by a feedforward transformation. Uh, and then we, we just repeat this. We do several layers of this. Uh, we also do the same for the decoder, uh, where the, decoding can, the decoder can only attend to words that have already been generated, pretty much as the CNN example that I was giving. It, it cannot attend to the future. Uh, so this is what the full architecture looks like. So this is where we put our source sentences. We have some input embeddings. Uh, there's going to be some positional encodings. I will explain later what these are. This is going to generate stage states for each word. So th this rectangle here, uh, it's just a pictorial thing. So it contains information for all words. Uh, and then, uh, so we then we have several layers and layers where each of these positions is going to attend to the states in the previous layer. Uh, it's going to compute a weighted representation of that layer. It's going to uh, propagate the information up in the computation graph. And then there's going to be a feed forward transformation then afterwards. And we just repeat this combination of multi-head attention. Well, I'm going to explain what multi-head attention is in a while. We just uh, repeat this combination of self-attention and feed forwards. Uh, and the decoder, so this is the decoder part. The decoder has something similar. Here, this is the target that we want to produce. So at training time, this is the reference. At test time, we are generating this. Uh, so this is basically doing the same thing, but now it's attending not only over self-attention over the targets, but it's also attending over the states that come from the encoder. So there are three attention components here. There is self-attention in, the in the source, there's self-attention in the targets, and there is this contextual attention, which is the decoder attending to the information that the encoder produces. So this, this uh, contextual attention is the same that we already had in RNNs. Um, and then we have, again, n layers of this. And then at the end, we have uh, the output probability is computing according to a softmax transformation. So this model is a lot more complex than the simpler BioLSTM with attention models. Uh, but it's also, uh, you know, in general, much more accurate. But we need to define some, some building blocks first, okay? So it's not easy to, trans to explain transformer networks for people who are seeing this for the first time. Yeah. Why do you call it a oh, sorry. Ah, why it's called transformer? That's a good question. Uh, so my intuition is that maybe it's because it's transforming these representations over and over through the different layers, but I'm just speculating. <laughs> Uh, so, and actually people use the name transformer for things that are not even sequence to sequence. So they, they also use the name transformers for BERT, which is just uh, kind of reconstructing the input to compute uh, representations that can be used in transfer learning. Yeah, so, um, okay, so, um, so let's look at the building blocks of transformer networks. Uh, there are two interesting innovations being done here. One is uh, something called the scale dot product attention. And the second one, maybe more interesting, is something called multi-head attention that is very important in practice. So if you don't use these two innovations, transformers are not going to work well, especially the second one. OK, so um, all right, so this, let me see if I have some expressions here. So this is a picture extracted uh, from figures in the paper that explain these two innovations. Um, I think this, is, this might be easier after looking at these expressions before. So let me explain scale dot attention, sc uh, scale dot product attention before. So we have three inputs. Uh, so there's going to be a query vector, which is the decoder state. This is basically, you know, if you want to attend over the previous layer on the on the encoder or the decoder, if we are doing self attention on the decoder, uh, the this is the vector that we are using as query. So in the case of the RNN model with attention, this query vector was the previous state on the decoder, 
that is going to attend over the source. So we call this Curie vector Q. Okay, this is pretty general. Uh, and then there's going to be two matrices that in the RNN with attention are exactly the same, but in general they can be different. There's going to be a key matrix, okay, uh, where the columns are key vectors. So these are basically um, things that we are going to attend to. So each column of this matrix uh, is a vector representation of the positions that they are going to attend to. Um, and then we have a matrix V called the value matrix that we are going to use to compute the weighted representation of the source. Okay, so in, 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 in general, this can be, these matrices can be different. Even though in the RNN model with attention, we use the same thing for computing the similarities and for computing the weighted representation of the source. But in theory, the keys and values might, might not be the same. So you have these three ingredients, the query vector, um, that is, that is associated to a state, uh, the matrix K and the matrix V. Um, and so the output of this is going to be a weighted sum of values where each weight is computed by a dot product between the query and the corresponding key. So this means the following. We are computing uh, the dot product between the matrix K, the key matrix, and the query vector Q. So we are basically taking the dot product between the query and each, uh, and so this should be key transpose. Uh, so we are computing the dot product between the query vector and each column of the matrix K. Um, so this is kind of looking at similarity between uh, that query vector and each word that you are attending to. Uh, and then we, we compute an attention probability, A, this is a probability distribution, and we compute the average state V bar by multiplying the, mat the value matrix V by the attention distribution A. So this is similar to what we had before in the RNN with attention, where we had F times A. Uh, and so this is now the uh, representation that we have after attending to the source. Um, and so if you do multiple queries, so if you have different positions in the self-attention encoder attending to different uh, places in the, in the inputs, then we can uh, use several query vectors in parallel at the same time, which means that we are going to have a matrix Q that contains these vectors Q as columns. Uh, and we can write uh, all these operations as softmax of Q times K transpose times the value matrix V, and this gives us V bar. So this gives us the representation that we're going to use at a subsequent layer after soft attention. So maybe this is a kind of a bit too heavy, but uh, it kind of explains the main operations that are needed in transformers. Uh, so the second idea that was important was something called scale dot product attention. Uh, so the main problem is that as the dimensionality of the hidden space gets large, the variance uh, of Q transpose K, so the dot product between the query vector and the key vector, is going to increase. So this is a general thing that happens if you go to a high dimensional space. Um, and therefore the softmax is going to get very peaked and the gradient is going to get smaller. So they found empirically that a good idea is to scale by the length uh, of the query Q vectors by using the square root of DK. This was kind of a heuristic solution to this problem. Uh, there's a lot of engineering, and this, this is important to point out. There's been a tremendous amount of engineering that was being done for transformers to work. So they, they, they worked on this for several time until it worked. It's much, uh, uh, in general, it's much uh, harder to tune hyperparameters for transformers than it is for RNNs. Okay, so, so this is basically, you know, this two innovations that I was mentioning. Uh, another innovation that was very important was something called multi-head attention. This was also important for transformers to work. Uh, so self-attention lets each word state form a query vector and attend to the other words key vectors, uh, which is kind of similar to a 1D convolution. But if you think about your lecture on convolutions, um, 
Ah, okay, so, so this is another point. So, so this is similar to what we do with convolutions, but now the filter weights are dynamic um, and the window size spans the entire sentence, not just a, a limited size window. Uh, so this is kind of, if you are more familiar with convolutions, self-attentions are kind of similar to a dynamic form of convolutions. Um, but in convolutions, typically you use multiple channels. You don't just use a single channel, right? And this, the solution for that is using something called multi-head attention, which means that instead of just doing uh, one attention uh, at every position, we, we have multiple attention heads. So we have multiple channels that independently do attention. Um, and this is done by first taking these query, key, and value matrices, projecting them in a lower dimensional space, and then applying attention in these multiple channels concatenate the outputs and pipe through the linear layer. So mathematically, this is what this means. Uh, so um, so I if we have uh, a key a query matrix Q, a key matrix K, and a value matrix V, the operation multi-head of Q, K, and V is going to concatenate uh, the output of the multiple attention heads that corresponds to a lower dimensional projection of these matrices Q, K, and V. So these are model parameters that are doing the projections. Um, so we compute an attention operation for each of these heads. Each head has a different projection operation. And then we concatenate uh, the outputs of the attentions. We multiply again by another matrix. And this is going to be our final representation um, for that uh, position. So this, is, this ends up being a trick that is necessary for things to work. And there's, there's also other tricks. You know, self-attention blocks are repeated six times. In bigger models, it's more than six. So these models are much deeper than the ones that you usually see in BLSTMs. We also have residual connections on each attention block. Uh, so these residual connections uh, so we also have a way of shortcutting information that goes through the different attention layers. And we need positional encoding. So with, with the ingredients that I described right now, it's not possible to distinguish word positions. Right? There is nothing here that indicates word order. So what, what is done is to uh, use as the input not just word embeddings, but also embeddings for the word positions. And this way, the self-attentions are able to know which position they are attending to. Uh, and they also need to use layer normalization for this to work. Okay, so this was a quick gist on what transformers do. And this is what they uh, attend. So if you look at the attention is all you need paper, uh, they provide a visualization about what is being captured in the different, different attention heads and different layers. And of course, reality is not as nice as what they have in the paper because there's like a, I think they usually have eight attention attention heads and six attention layers, which means that there are there's 48 attention mappings that we can look at. There's a lot of information, so they probably just cherry picked uh, a few of them that look to capture interesting information. But so the ones that they uh, show are capturing things that are quite sensible. Like for example, here making the registration or voting process more difficult. Uh, so this more difficult refers to making, so we are making something more difficult. Uh, but there's a few words in the middle. So if you try to model this with an RNN, information might get lost because the distance between making and more difficult you know, is, is, is fairly large. There's a few words in the middle. Uh, but transformers are able to attend to the right information uh, which turns out to be important if we are translating from English to another language. Um, so another interesting aspect is an Afro resolution. So here uh, the law will never be perfect, but its application should something. So the it's, uh, it's a pronoun and it refers to the law. And the model is kind of uh, attending to the right thing to decide how to translate this pronoun it's. So an Afro resolution is a a common uh, difficulty in machine translation systems for many language pairs. Okay, so, uh, okay, there's a few more transformer tricks. I'm not, 
I think I'm done with tricks, but you know, just convince yourself that there's even more. Um, so overall, transformers are harder to optimize than RNNs. Uh, they don't work out of the box. It's very important to spend some time doing hyperparameter tuning. Uh, but in practice, when they work, it can be much better than, than RNNs. So this is the uh, table of results that they had in the, in the paper that compares uh, transformers with a bunch of other models, including uh, the ones that I mentioned from Facebook using convolutions, the previous version of RNNs from Google, and so on and so forth. And again, a few extra points in both uh, English to German and English to French. Uh, and I think I'm over time, right? Ah, okay, okay. Well, this, this, is, this is, I just have a couple more slides uh, about how we can use transformers for transfer learning. This is a topic that is very uh, active right now. Uh, so besides machine translation, we can also use transformers just for language generation. Uh, so an example is uh, the GP2 model that you might have heard of. Uh, this is a transformer-based language model that was trained uh, on 8 million web pages. Uh, with a crazy number of parameters, 1.5 billion parameters. So, you know, uh, the current size of these models is now getting into billions of parameters. So this requires daunting computational resources to train. Um, and the training objective of this model was very simple. So this is just a vanilla transformer without just a, a decoder, not with the encoder. So the training objective was just to predict the next words given all the previous words. Uh, or at like a big context. Uh, and so at test time, they, they did a trick that ended up being important, which is they, uh, they do a top K uh, uh, ranking of the scores uh, in the final softmax. They ju just keep the top K, and then they uh, renormalize the probabilities, and they sample from that truncated probability distribution. And of course, there's a lot of hype that has been uh, following the release of this model with GPT-2, including claims that it was not safe to, to release the model as it is. Anyway, so this is an example. So if you go to this site, talk to transformer.com, you can play a little bit with it, or at least like a, a small version of the model. And the way it works, well, this was not the text that GPT-2 generated. This is what I wrote. So, <laughs> so the way it works is you write a prompt, uh, and then GPT-2 completes the text. So I just went there this morning and wrote this, and it generated this. So it's much more realistic than the kind of text that I showed you before when we talked about n-gram models uh, and, and, and simple RNNs. Uh, it's quite realistic, right? I had originally expected a much more procedural and algorithmic approach as well, but was pleasantly surprised by the level of expertise of the students. These were both very experienced mathematicians, but also add an appreciation for machine learning techniques. <laughs> very grammatical. These are the same school that created and operates the very popular Algorithmia blog. I don't know if it, this exists. It's, I think it made that completely. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know of any blog with this name. Maybe there is one, but, but this model has a tendency to invent things completely. So they aren't exactly new to me and are well known to other Algorithmia grads at the University of Central Europe, which I think don't, doesn't exist either. So this, this model has a tendency to invent entities by, I don't know, aggregating information. But yeah, so this text looks much better uh, than the ones that I showed before. You know, you can go to this site and play with it. You'll get impressed. Um, so another example is BERT. Uh, so transformers can also be used to pre-train big models and then fine-tune them for specific tasks. So this is a very simple uh, form of transfer learning that ends up being extremely effective for many tasks. And it's, it's kind of killing a lot of NLP research because now we can get better scores just by applying this technique as opposed to develop, developing models from scratch for these tasks. Uh, but so the, 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 what BERT does, it's very simple. So it, it, takes, um, so it takes a bunch of sentences um, it masks uh, some words of each sentence, and then it trains a transformer model to recover those words from the context. And by doing that, it forces 
the model to encode the context well enough such that we can recover the words that are missing. Um, and so, since it's a transformer model, it has this, uh, it's not a sequential model, uh, so it can attend both the left and right context at the same time. So we can condition on information that comes simultaneously from the left and the right. Um, and in doing so, uh, it learns uh, very good contextual word representations, just like Elmo. So I think I, did I, did I mention Elmo in the morning? I think I did it very briefly, right? So Elmo does something with the same goal, but using a bio STM uh, instead of a transformer. And it was very uh, effective at the time. You know, now there's a, all a new generation of, of uh, uh, techniques, all with names like these, Elmo, Bert, and like old Sesame Street characters. There's a new one by Baidu Research that was proposed, I think, last week, that you might have seen, another Sesame Street character. But so, um, yeah, so we can use these contextual word representations as a pre-trained model, and we can fine-tune them in any downstream task. And the original BERT paper, uh, you know, they, they use this, this strategy to achieve state-of-the-art on 11 uh, NLP tasks from the GLUE um, uh, leaderboard uh, set of tasks, and they, they got like a very big absolute point improvement in the GLUE scores. So this is kind of a metric that aggregates uh, various uh, NLP tasks. Um, and so this is kind of a quick uh, picture of what BERT is doing. So it, it, uh, it actually, they, they trained the model to be able to also solve tasks like question answering that require pairs of sentences. And so the model is trained not only to recover uh, input words that are masked, at random, but also to predict uh, the second sentence given the first one. And this forces the model to also uh, obtain vector representations of the full sentence. So these special tokens here are used to obtain representations of the first sentence and the second sentence. Um, and that this is it. So then they combine position embeddings uh, with segment embeddings that tells us if the if this token belongs to the first sentence or the second sentence, and token embeddings for the words. So after BERT, there was another model, uh, well, two other models, Transformer Excel and ExcelNet. So Transformer Excel is even bigger than the Transformer model that I was just describing. Um, so the, it was developed primarily for language modeling, for conditioning on bigger context sizes. And the main trick is that, uh, so simplifying things a little bit, the main trick is that uh, each uh, layer of attention can attend to a little bit more context. So instead of defining like a, a, a pre, defining a, 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 um, the maximum context that, that uh, the full model needs to look at, uh, so each attention head can look a little bit further to the left. And if you stack these different layers on top of each other, this means that overall we can represent a bigger context. And they take advantage of that um, by, uh, so basically by, by in increasing the context that gets represented without disrupting the temporal coherence. Uh, and so based on Transformer Excel, there was this recent model called ExcelNet that uh, outperformed BERT in some of the tasks that I mentioned before in GLUE. Um, by introducing kind of a few other innovations, including sampling different generation ordering. So I'm not going into details about that. Okay, so this was it. So to conclude, so I started to talk about machine translation, which is a key problem in AI since the 50s. Uh, neural MT with sequence to sequence models were a, was a breakthrough. A breakthrough. Uh, representing a full sentence with a single vector is a bottleneck. And this motivated uh, using attention mechanisms. That was a big discovery. Um, so they allow focusing on different parts of the input and solve this bottleneck. Uh, encoders, decoders can be either RNNs, CNNs, or self-attention, as in the case of transformers. Transformers are the current state of the art in this task. Uh, there's other applications of all these models besides MT. For example, in speech recognition, uh, image captioning, and so on and so forth. And I briefly touched the topic of transfer learning by using 
some of these ideas, uh, including models like BERT and XLNet. Okay, so this is it. Let me know if you have any questions. Yeah, um, I'm wondering, like, how do you deal with, like, large number of vocabularies for machine translation? So, I thought that, I think that, you know, words that are rarely appear in the training set, uh, it's get, like, really, it's hard to translate them, right? I don't know, how do you deal with that? Yeah, this is a great question. So, I, I, I overlooked that topic, I didn't talk about that, but this was kind of a very hot topic in 2016. Uh, when, by the time people came up with the neural MT, uh, with the sequence to sequence with attention, the big limitation that existed at the time was how to scale up to the vocabulary size. And there were a few papers that made some, that proposed some very simple strategies that, uh, well, I didn't, I wouldn't say that they solved the problem, but they mitigate the problem for a lot of language pairs. For example, using subword units, uh, byte pair encodings. Maybe it doesn't work for languages. I've heard that it doesn't work for Thai. Um, but so there's also other approaches that combine word level and character level models. Um, I, I think it's still an open area of research coming up with something better than uh, BPE or word pieces. So word pieces is the Google solution for providing some words. Um, but I, I, I'm not very convinced by what I've seen so far that tries to use uh, linguistic information to determine where the subwords should be. Um, I, from what I've seen, I, the, the, there doesn't seem to be like a big gain over subword units, except for a small number of languages. Uh, so either we make these very language specific uh, and come up with a solution that works for every language, but I didn't find a generic method that, for example, can discover automatically how it should split words just based on characters. That will be a very exciting uh, model. A model that could look at the characters and uh, decide, based on this data, how it should split the words, but uh, in a way that adapts uh, to the different languages. Hello. Okay. For the task like machine translation or uh, like sentence similarity using transformer or bird, do you think that uh, is there any need to use the pass of speech or name identity recognition as part of the training set? So, so the question is uh, using uh, name identity recognition as part of the training set, yeah. but like training it as a, a simultaneously with models for other tasks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, are there any need to do that, or we can completely ah, ignore okay. that part of space because it's hard to find such other uh, corpus, right? So the question is. Ah, okay, okay. So the the question is if if uh, these systems benefit from uh, other layers of linguistic information, part of speech tagging, name identity recognition, and so on. Uh, what I what I think is that uh, you know uh, uh, slowly we are kind of. Uh, requiring less and less of that information. Uh, so it doesn't mean that uh, we don't need it, uh, but I think that uh, models like uh, transformers and so on are able to capture information that otherwise would be captured in NER systems without the need of training specific NER systems for each language, which I think is a very important finding. But there are still problems like, for example, one big problem in MT that it's not solved yet is how to translate taking the context into account. This is what my team is working on right now. You know, if you, if, you don't, if you want to translate not just a single sentence, but you want to take into account the full document, uh, you know, uh, m information, there is important linguistic information like coreference information, uh, pronouns, where are the pronouns referring to, and so on. That's so right now, the existing MT systems are still not able to, to exploit in a satisfa satisfactory way. So I think this is pretty much an open research problem. So I guess that's probably the last question, but I think Andrea is going to be around a little bit uh, later today, so we can discuss it offline. So 
Okay, so that basically concluded the, the NLP sessions. Um, I hope uh, everyone enjoyed the, the lecture. So I also learned a lot uh, about uh, NLP. So, and <laughs> um, yeah, that's why I asked a lot of questions. Um, so we really appreciate that you can basically come here and share your, your experience and knowledge about NLP with, with us. So we have a very uh, small token of appreciation for you. And we hope that you enjoy your trip here and, and have a safe trip back to Portugal. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, th th thanks for, for inviting. It was a pleasure to be here and to meet uh,